I thought Proust's argument was brilliant. I, I talked about it with other folks online, and one objection they came up with was that, well, maybe time was discrete, that arbitrarily compressible time was impossible, in which case you couldn't stuff infinitely many Reaper events into a finite time region. Hi, I'm John DeRosa, and you're listening to the Classical Theism Podcast, where we defend Catholic Christian ideas in conversation and love the God of classical theism with all of our heart and all of our mind. Welcome back to the Classical Theism Podcast, where we glorify the God of classical theism and defend Catholic Christian ideas in conversation. As you know, at the Classical Theism Podcast, we set out to defend three core pillars of the Catholic Christian worldview. One, that the God of classical theism exists. Two, that Jesus is our Lord and Messiah. And three, that he founded the Catholic Church. And today's episode is going to be relevant to that first pillar. In particular, if you're making a cumulative case for God's existence and trying to offer multiple reasons for someone to believe in God or to to think it's true that God actually exists, and I think we have good reasons for that, you might include the Kalam cosmological argument in your arsenal. And I know a lot of, you know, a lot of classical theists may not like that, or particularly some Thomists will not like the Kalam cosmological argument because Thomas Aquinas famously argued that one couldn't show philosophically one way or the other whether the universe had a beginning or not. Now, he does say in one place that the arguments for that the universe had a beginning are not devoid of probability, meaning that he does think they have some force to them, but they definitely cannot succeed in in showing a philosophical demonstration. Nonetheless, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas was not aware of some of the interesting paradoxes that have been put forth in more contemporary philosophical times. So in the 20th century, going back to the 1960s, which our guest is going to explain, and that he, so our guest is Wade Tisthammer, who I'll introduce him in a moment, but he kind of takes Jose Benedetti's paradoxes, which Robert Coons, Dr. Robert Coons, has discussed in the podcast before, and he kind of puts his own spin on it and creates the eternal society paradox. And so again, the way all of these proceed is to, let's assume the past is infinite. Let's assume the universe never began to exist, that time didn't have a beginning. And let's run with that and see what we end up with. And if we get ourselves into a predicament where we have a logical contradiction coming into play, then we have to cast aside one of the assumptions that led to this logical contradiction. And what Dr. Coons argues, and what Wade Tisthammer is going to argue, is that we really should set aside that assumption that the past can be infinite. Um, So he's going to make that argument, the eternal society paradox. He says it kind of fast. He talks a bit quickly. So I'm just going to give you a, a, a primer so that you're ready for it when it comes about. But imagine a society, imagine that time is infinite and a society has always existed with modest capabilities. And every year, once a year, this society performs a coin flipping tradition where they flip a coin and if it lands heads and it's never landed heads before, they do a special chant. Okay, so they do a chant uh, if those conditions are met. And if the coin just comes up tails, well, they don't do the chant. And you could picture the society, let's say the society existed only a finite time ago, 100 years ago, 300 years ago. Doesn't seem to be anything too implausible about this society. But suppose the society existed always and eternally into the past. Well, then we get ourselves in a sticky situation. So I'm going to let Wade Tisthammer explain the rest of that. The eternal society paradox, I think it's a great argument to use in support of the second premise of the Kalam cosmological argument. Hope you enjoy this interview. I'm joined today by Wade A. Tisthammer, who has a Bachelor of Science degree in computer science and a minor in mathematics. Working as a full-time software developer, he's also a part-time undergraduate philosophy student with plans to seek a graduate degree in philosophy. His philosophical interests include philosophy of religion, moral philosophy, and philosophy of mind. Online, he's known as Maverick Christian. Wade Tisthammer, welcome to the Classical Theism Podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. So what got you interested in philosophy and apologetics? Give us some highlights of your backstory. I was raised Christian, and I think I was always kind of oriented in a way to want to have rational grounds for my beliefs. And of course, apologetics fits into this. Uh, Mostly when it comes to apologetics, I gravitate towards 
philosophy nowadays, such as atheism versus theism type of stuff. I find that particularly interesting in part because, while I think atheism has at least superficial rationality to a significant degree, I'm even intellectually sympathetic to it. I think upon closer examination, it has serious intellectual problems. I'm curious to see how atheists react to these problems. So I was relatively active online for a while on this matter. I created my blog back in 2012. One of the highlights is, is some of my fellow Christians online got together in 2016 in Atlanta to meet Dr. William Lane Craig and visit his adult Sunday school class. William Lane Craig is the prominent Christian philosopher who coined the term Kalam cosmological argument and revived it in contemporary philosophy, so it was delightful for me to meet a philosopher I've admired. One of the Christians in our group was John McRae, and he would later create a popular Christian YouTube channel called What Do You Meme, much of it apologetics related. Another notable group member was Cameron Vertusi, and he would later create a ministry called Capturing Christianity, which on its YouTube channel has brought on scholars like Luke Barnes, William Lane Craig, and Graham Moppy to discuss apologetic stuff. And I found that very impressive because even though Cameron isn't a scholar himself, he's found a way to deliver very high quality content. And Capturing Christianity is even having a conference scheduled in 2021 with multiple speakers and sponsors, which is, which is amazing. Kudos to Cameron's wife, Brittany, for her work on that. So another highlight for me is that both John McRae and Cameron Bertuzzi have on occasion asked me to help out with their content, and I'm honored to be a part of it. They're both remarkable people. Uh, recently, as of this recording, of course, I published my paper on the eternal society paradox. It's my first paper published in a philosophy journal, and anyone can read it for free. One really cool thing about it for me is that Brigham Young University runs the journal my paper is published in, and that's the same university my favorite violinist, Lindsey Sterling, graduated from. All right. Well, that is some interesting stuff. I did not know that background that you knew Cameron Bertuzzi and John McRae going way back. I've listened to some of the videos where they got you involved when you were discussing the fine tuning argument. Really, really interesting stuff. So I'll definitely link to some of that in the show notes for for listeners to check it out. Like you said, it's very high quality content. And of course, your Maverick Christian uh, channel and blog, I'll link to that as well. Uh, But yeah, we're going to dive into this paper, The Eternal society paradox. I love it because when I read this paper, I found your your writing was very clear, the argument, you could follow it. And, and as you said, it's, it's available for free for anyone to read. But why don't you just give us an overview? What's it about and why did you write it? So it involves the Green Reaper paradox, which itself needs some explaining. In the 1960s, Jose Benardetti had a paradox involving an infinite sequence of assassins shooting somebody in the heart with each bullet killing that man instantly if he wasn't already dead. So one person shoots him in the last half minute, Another person shoots in the last one-fourth minute, another shoots him in the last one-eighth minute, and so on ad infinitum. The result is a paradox because this man can't survive the infinite onslaught of bullets, and yet no bullet kills him, because for each bullet you point to, there's there's a prior bullet before that. Now, Better Deddy did include that a self-contradiction emerges here, but instead believed that the man would die from the onslaught of bullets prior to any bullet hitting him. Decades later, a philosopher named John Hawthorne cited Better Deadity's paradox, and he created a similar paradox in which he too thought the fusion of assassins caused the man's death. Later, however, David Chalmers cited Better Deadity and Hawthorne and published his own version that had two key things. One is the assassins became Grim Reapers, and two is he added certain crucial details that guaranteed an inevitable self-contradiction, making it impossible for a fusion of assassins to cause the man's death. The Grim Reaper paradox, as Chalmers wrote about it in 2002, goes as follows. There are countably many Grim Reapers, one for every positive integer. Grim Reaper 1 is disposed to kill you with a scythe at 1 p.m. if and only if you are still alive, then otherwise his scythe remains immobile throughout, taking 30 minutes to do it. Grim Reaper 2 is disposed to kill you with a scythe at 1230 p.m. if and only if you are still alive, then taking 15 minutes about it. Grim Reaper number 3 is disposed to kill you with a scythe at 1215 p.m. and so on. You're still alive just before 12 p.m. You can only die through the motion of a green mirror side. Then once dead, you stay dead. On the face of it, this situation seems conceivable. Each green reaper seems conceivable individually and intrinsically. And it seems reasonable to combine distinct individuals with distinct intrinsic properties into one situation. But little reflection reveals that the situation described is contradictory. I cannot survive to any moment past 12 p.m. A Grim Reaper would get me first, but I cannot be killed for Grim Reaper N to kill me. I must have survived Grim Reaper N plus one, which is impossible. So a fusion of Grim Reapers can't cause your death because you can die only through the motion of Grim Reaper's side, and the conditions of the scenario imply that all Grim Reaper's sides are immobile. Around 2011, I found out that Alexander Bruce's Grim Reaper paradox argument against backwards series of infinite events that he published in his blog in 2009. It's the same one I cite in my Eternal Society Paradox paper. I thought Proust's argument was brilliant. I had talked about it with other folks online, and one objection they came up with was that, well, maybe time was discrete, that arbitrarily compressible time was impossible, in which case you couldn't stuff infinitely many Reaper events into a finite time region. So I then came up with my own type of paradox that avoids this problem, what became known as the Eternal Society Paradox. 
Unfortunately for me, I didn't get this published right away and I kind of sat on it for a while. So that accomplishment is relatively minor significance because I wasn't the first person to publish a Grim Reaper style paradox that avoids that particular problem. Rob Coods and Alexander Proust have, have both done this, but it's, it is certainly a useful feature to have in my argument against an infinite past. But even though others had beat me to it regarding the discrete time thing, I still thought this paradox is useful because in addition to having a paradox that doesn't require arbitrarily compressible space and time, I think this version would have strong intuitive appeal, being dialectically effective. And it's just plain cool that an internal society with the abilities of ordinary humans in each year of its existence would have had the ability to bring about a logically contradictory situation, like the paper says. Surely there is something metaphysically suspicious about an infinite past of an internal society with the abilities of ordinary humans can actualize a logical contradiction. All right. So the, it's a, it's an interesting setup. And we've actually had Dr. Rob Coons on the show before. We've talked about his argument and the updating of it. He calls it the unbounded version, where you take the Grim Reapers, instead of stuffing them into within the hour and then within the minute and within the second, instead of stuffing that into, you know, infinitely... Uh, infinitesimally compressible time. Instead of doing that, he bounds it into the past, into uh, years BC and so forth. So I'll refer listeners back to the episode where we had Dr. Kuhn's on to discuss that. But I like yours, the eternal society paradox, because one, it gives a different setting than just Grim Reapers. And two, like you said, yeah, it might have some more intuitive appeal. So the setup, I'm going to let you lay it out in a moment. But it's it's similar to what Dr. Coons is doing in you're constructing, you're assuming an infinite past and you're saying, OK, if the past is infinite, then, you know, it would be possible to have this eternal society. But then you're going to show us how that actually runs into some problems. So if folks are new to this, I would highly recommend check out some of the previous episodes we've done with Dr. Rob Coons on the Grim Reaper Paradox. But now I'm going to turn it over to you, Wade, and give you some space to lay out the eternal society paradox. Walk us through how this is set up. So in the paper, the eternal societies that has existed for a beginningless infinite duration of time and has the abilities of ordinary humans in each year of its existence. So for example, in each year, people in the society can flip coins, they can write books, they can sing songs and pass on information contained in the current year to the next year. Because of the society's extremely modest abilities, it seems like an eternal society would be possible if an infinite past were possible. So by possible, I'm referring to metaphysical possibility as opposed to, for example, physical possibility. Now imagine the eternal society has the following annual coin flipping tradition. Each year they flip a coin, and if it comes up heads, they all get together to do a particular chant, but only if they've never done the chant before. If the coin does not come up heads, they do not do the chant for that year. That's basically the initial setup. Okay, so let's just make sure we have this. We've got an eternal society. It's We're saying if the infinite past is possible, we have an eternal society that has always existed. They got basic societal capabilities. They can, you know, transmit information and so forth. They can flip coins. And they have a tradition where they flip a coin. And if it lands heads, then they will do a special chant. And you can make the chant whatever you want. In the paper, the chant is... Grim Reapers do not exist, but it can make it anything you like. And so if it's heads, they do the chant, but only if they've never done the chant before. So if it's heads and they had done the chant before, they wouldn't do anything. Well, actually, let me let you explain that um, with the setup. But that's the general idea. Infinite past, eternal society. They flip a coin once a year. And if it's heads, they do a chant if they hadn't done the chant before. So why and how does this setup lead to a contradiction? The coin flips are probabilistically independent events, so any particular infinite permutation of coin flips is equally possible. Consider scenario S1 in which a coin comes up heads for the first time last year. The Eternal Society gets together to do the chant for the first time. That seems like it would be possible if an infinite past were possible, an Eternal Society with the ability of ordinary humans, by which I mean the Society has the ability of ordinary humans in each year of existence, could surely do something like this. But this scenario is provably not possible. Again, the coin flips are probabilistically independent events. So if scenario S1 were possible, then another scenario that we can call scenario S2 would be possible. The coin came up heads each year of the infinite past. If the coin came up heads each year, did the society ever do the chant? They would have had to have done the chant some year because they would have done the chant last year if they hadn't done it yet, since the coin came up heads last year. And yet, any year you point to, there is a prior year in which they would have done the chant if they had not done the chant before. So they had to have done the chant as the coin came up heads last year, yet they could not have done the chant. There is no year in which they could have done it. So this society creates an, uh, a logical contradiction. So although scenario S1 is not directly self-contradictory, scenario S1 is impossible because it implies the possibility of a logical contradiction. The eternal society argument against an infinite past goes like this. First premise is, if an infinite past were possible, an eternal society would be possible. Second premise, 
If an eternal society were possible, the scenario S1 would be possible. Third premise. If S1 were possible, then S2 would be possible. Premise four. S2 is not possible. Conclusion. Therefore, an infinite past is not possible. Though the way I word in the paper, premise one is actually line 11 because it's like the 11th line in the paper. Yeah, no, it, it's it's really intriguing to me. And I just, I want to go over it one more time for the listeners because w- when you hear this for the first time, it can, it can sound a little complex. But S1, the scenario is that there's an eternal society. They've always existed. There's an infinite past and they flip a coin once a year. And if it's heads, they do a chant only if they haven't done the chant before. And your key move here is you're saying, okay, that seems like it's possible. I mean, it doesn't seem like there's anything impossible about that intrinsically. I don't see what's wrong with that if the past is infinite. And we'll, we'll get into some more responses. But then you're saying that if that's possible, then this second scenario, S2, is at least possible. And what was S2 again? And then just one more time, why does that cause the contradiction? Because it's, it's hard to follow when you just hear it once. I want to give you a chance to explain that again. What's S2 and then why does that make a contradiction? Okay, so scenario S1 is where the coin flip happens, comes up heads for the first time last year. Scenario S2 is when it comes up heads infinitely many times, like heads each year. So because they're probabilistically independent events, if that first scenario is possible, the second scenario would also be possible because it's just coin flipping heads. And, that's and so the a- second scenario is they get heads every year. Is yeah. that correct? Okay, so that we're saying that it's possible that during this annual tradition, they flip it and get heads every year. Uh, I, do I have you right there? Yeah. Okay, and then why is that a contradiction? Well, because of the specified conditions of the annual coin flipping tradition, they do the he- if it comes up heads, we're going to do the chant, but only if we've never done the chant before. So it seems like, okay, they'd have to do the chant sometime because it came up heads last year, so they would have done the chant then if, if nowhere else. But any year you point to, there's a prior in which they would have done the chant had they never done the chant before. So they had to have done the chant and yet they could not have done the chant because there's no year in which they could have done it. And that's where you get a logical contradiction. Uh, it's, it's a really cool setup. I like it. And, and folks who are familiar with this type of argument, it's very similar to the unbounded version of the Grim Reaper, where one Grim Reaper will have his number written on the piece of paper, passing papers, but yet no Grim Reaper could have had his number. In this case, the Eternal Society must have done the chant at some point, because it's always heads, but no particular leader could they have done the chant. Okay. Sounds like a good argument to me, but if someone wanted to avoid your conclusion, Wade, which premise do you think that they would try to reject? And why don't you think it's an easy thing to do? Well, the premise I would reject if I were to attack this argument would be the first premise, which says if if an infinite past were possible, an eternal society would be possible. That seems to be the most vulnerable premise. But as the eternal society paradox paper says, surely there's something metaphysically suspicious about an infinite past of an eternal society with the ability of ordinary humans can actualize a logical contradiction. The idea that an infinite past is possible, but an eternal society is not possible strikes me as overly ad hoc due to the eternal society's extremely modest abilities. Because again, it's the abilities of ordinary humans in each year of its existence. Yeah. And it has a lot of it has a lot of intuitive to me, appeal for me as well. Because I'll tell you what, I've been on and off with the Kalam cosmological argument. I used to love it back in college. And then I heard some objections to it. And I was like, eh, I'm not sure if this still works. And then I'm like, oh, well, the science seems to point to this. And then recently I found these these paradoxes uh, very, very strong because it just doesn't seem like I just don't get why you couldn't have an eternal society. It seems like that's the, the premise you'd have to target. If the past is infinite, then an eternal society would be possible. Why wouldn't that be true? Like, it just seems weird to say that, okay, you can have infinite time, but there just better not be an eternal society in it. Like that just seems kind of a weird, like you said, contrived or ad hoc thing to say. But let me throw some more um, objections at you. Actually, first, a question. A question: Does your paradox presuppose any particular theory of time? So, for example, Dr. William Lane Craig is is known for defending the a uh, an a theory of time, saying the Kalam works on an a theory of time. Does your paradox only work on a theories? What would you say to that? Happily, the argument is entirely agnostic about which theory of time is true. One, one must remember that the eternal society is basically just a society with the ability of ordinary humans in each year of its existence. So it doesn't require assuming A theory or B theory. That's good for us then. So it sidesteps that question. Um, here's another objection, though. So recalling your argument then, and in your paper, it's number 11. So here's one additional objection someone might make to what you call premise 11. And Again, just to remind listeners, the argument, I'll have it up in the show notes page as long as the link to the paper. But that premise says that, well, if S1 were possible, then S2 would be possible. 
And I thought of a, an objection somebody might target this. And remember, S1 is just the Eternal Society existing with their annual coin flipping tradition. And there are rules about when they do the chant. S2 says coin comes up heads every year. It's always heads. So someone might challenge it just because S1 is possible doesn't mean S2 is possible uh, because of this reason. They may say, well, in order for an outcome to be possible, it has to have a non-zero probability. Can't have a zero probability. Yet, it's not clear that with S2, there's a non-zero probability there because the probability of the coin coming up heads every time, well, on any single coin flip, let's say it has a 0.5 chance of coming up heads or a 50% chance. And then the probability of it coming up heads every time in the infinite past seems to approach zero. Because if they're independent events and you do 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5, or as an exponential expression, it would be 0.5 to the N as N approaches infinity. If you look at that limit, that limit is zero. And so maybe the probability of S2 is just zero. So S2 isn't even possible at all. What would you say in response to that sort of objection? So that objection might sound convincing until you realize that if you have an infinite sequence of coin flips, some sort of sequence has to result and whatever infinite sequence you get had a probability of zero because the probability of each infinite sequence is 0.5 to the power of n with n going to infinity. Assuming, of course, it's heads or tails is equally likely and those are the only possibilities. Like when it lands on its edge, we keep flipping until it's heads or tails or something like that. So one might think that if something has a probability of zero, then it's impossible. That doesn't necessarily work so well when you have an infinite number of possible outcomes. The infinite permutation of coin flips in which the coin comes up has for the first time last year is possible if an infinite permutation of coin flips is possible, which would indeed be possible if an internal society is possible. Yeah, that, no, it's a good response because it, it got me thinking, you know, any possibility, and I actually teach this when I do introductory statistics, because I, I teach math and I teach statistics in high school. And we write out like when we're doing sample spaces, let's say we flip three coins. What are the possibilities? You know, heads, 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 tails, heads, and it, say five coins. And I always write like heads, 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 heads for five in a row. I'm like, okay, which? And then I write like heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, and mix it up. And I'm like, which of these outcomes is more likely? And, you know, kind of intuitively with this weird thing where we're like, oh, heads every time is less likely than heads, tails, heads, tails, heads. But you're absolutely right. Any single possibility is, is going to have an equal chance. So if it's zero, then, then anything's zero. So that would just mean you can't flip coins. Not only is the eternal society impossible, but if this objection went through, then coin flipping would be impossible. And that just seems even weirder. Not only can't you have an eternal society, you can't have you know, coin flipping forever. So that's interesting to me. Um, okay. So I, honestly, I think you've answered the objections that I could come up with. I'm curious, maybe I'll ask you at the end if there's been any new objections to this since you published it that you're still thinking about. But let me go on to this. How does this paradox relate to the Kalam cosmological argument? And do you think that's a good argument for God's existence? The Kalam cosmological argument says that the universe began to exist and thus requires a cause for its existence. And the eternal society paradox shows that an eternal society with the abilities of ordinary humans would have been able to create a logical contradiction, which strongly suggests that an infinite past is metaphysically impossible. And this provides some support for the universe beginning to exist since time itself began to exist. Is the Kalam cosmological argument a good argument for God's existence? Well, Sort of. The conclusion gets you a cause for the universe, but that by itself doesn't get you God's existence. You have to argue further to get to that. Now, you can make additional arguments to get you a cause with theologically significant properties. So known physical reality starts at around the Big Bang. And while some scientists speculate there may have been some sort of physical reality prior to that, we don't know that's the case. Now, if we know a past is finite, the universe, by which I mean contiguous space-time physical reality beginning at around the Big Bang, seems reasonably likely due to Occam's razor, if nothing else. If that's true, then the cause must be enormously powerful because creating that sort of universe is a big job. Note that if space-time itself began to exist and our space-time universe had a cause, that cause would have to transcend space and time. Now, whether you want to call this space-time transcending cause supernatural or not, such a cause would have to be something beyond the physical laws as we know them today. The fact that there is some sort of at least de facto supernatural cause beyond space and time creating the universe would seem to make atheism less plausible. So... If I were an atheist, I would actually more or less grant the two premises of the Kalam cosmological argument. I say more or less because it depends how you're defining the universe. If you're defining the universe to include all contiguous space-time in a way that would also include a temporal physical reality transcending space and time, creating the rest of physical reality, 
But if I were an atheist, I wouldn't believe the universe began to exist in that sense. I would believe physical reality in one sense is eternal, but not in the sense of having an infinite past, but in that there is a unit of contiguous space-time physical reality that had a finite past required a cause with that cause being some sort of atemporal, non-conscious physical entity bringing about the rest of the universe. In another sense, the universe began to exist if you define it as contiguous space-time reality so that it, it wouldn't include atemporal physical causes, in which case the universe would begin to exist, but the cause would just be another non-conscious physical entity. Even then, though, this entity would have to be something beyond the physical laws as we know them today to be a cause, and the fact that there is some sort of at least de facto supernatural cause beyond space and time creating the universe does, as I said, seem to make atheists the most plausible. So I think the Kalam cosmological argument has its place in providing evidence for theism, even if it's not a slam dunk. I think that's a good take on it. I definitely think it belongs in any cumulative case if those premises can be defended as you've done. Um, I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but I'm just curious, have you seen any additional objections to the ones that I've raised or when you've presented this paper uh, or shown it to others, have people come up, come up with any new objections or really it's the ones that we've kind of dealt with already? I'm just curious about that. Or are you still thinking about some yourself? Uh, there was one that somebody brought up in a, a chat online, and that was denying the idea that eternal society, part of it is that the eternal society could keep track of whether they did the champ before. And they questioned that. And I kind of argued, it's like, well, no, I think they could. And I gave this situation. Okay, suppose this situation is possible. Wait, sorry. Let me just get clear on what they're challenging. They're challenging whether, not whether the Eternal Society could exist and do the tradition, but whether they could keep track of it. Keep track of whether they did the chant before. I see. Okay. So one idea is that, well, if they if they flipped coin, flipped heads, then they just always have this propositional content of we did the chant, even though they never did the chant. And I thought that was interesting, but here's how I responded back to that. Uh, suppose, consider this scenario. Is it possible that an Eternal Society in which they had this propositional content propagating, we did not do the chant every year, and they had not done the chant. Uh, but the coin comes up heads, and but each year they're disposed to say, if we did the chant this year, then we're going to transmit that propositional content to the next year. And they don't do the chant until the next last year. And he said, yeah, I think that's possible. But if you think that's possible, then we have a situation in this scenario that if they were not to have done the chant, then that message we did not do the chant would be propagated throughout on your eternity. But if they did do the chant some year, then that propositional message, that content of we did the chant would be propagating for the rest of the year. To sum it up then, in this scenario, if we if they did not do the chant, then they would believe it. But if they did do the chant, then they would believe they had done the chant. So then in that scenario, their belief is truth tracking. And if their belief is truth tracking about whether they did the chant, then they would be able to keep track of whether they did the chant this year in this scenario. And once you add in the, the coin flipping thing, then you get scenario S1. That's exactly what scenario S1 is. And of course, if scenario S1 is possible, then scenario S2 is possible, and we're off to the races. Oh, that is a good response. Thank you for, for adding that. And I think I'm going to refer folks, check out this paper. It's, it's interesting. It's readable. It's clear. And I think it's a good argument for the finite past. I think the next challenge, if I might just speculate myself, and you don't have to comment on this, beyond what uh, Coons and Proust and yourself are doing is because I think these arguments are good for the, for the, for the, um, for the impossibility of an infinite past. I think they're good arguments. I think what turns some people off to them just on first hearing is they seem to involve these scenarios with weird things going on. Grim Reapers arranged passing pieces of paper, eternal societies flipping things and doing chants. I think if someone could develop, perhaps yourself, perhaps others, an even like more general description of what causes the the contradiction, then that might have more intuitive appeal to folks. But even if we can't find like a more general, easier or quicker way to understand it, um, I still think it works. It's kind of like uh, you, I'm sure you're familiar with as, with the minor in math. You know Russell's paradox and set theory. Yeah, the the barber paradox, barber's paradox. I remember that. Right, the barber's paradox is the nice common man like illustration of it in the real world but like the abstract way of getting it it's suppose there's a set of all sets and then if there's a set of all sets there could be a set that contained all the sets that are not elements of themselves and like it just gets really complicated really fast and i remember trying to wrap my mind about this in, in, in a, an intro to set theory class as an undergrad it was hard but i think because some of these you know but it's true what russell showed there is that there can't be a set of all sets. And it was true. So just because this involves a little bit of logic, a little bit of deep thinking, and some some perhaps a little bit complex scenarios, um, that doesn't mean it's wrong. 
It doesn't mean it's false. I think your argument is good. So wait to December. Thank you so much for joining us on the Classical Theism Podcast. I'm going to give you the last word if you want to comment on that or where you think this, this argument could go next. But at the very least, let listeners know where can they go to find out more about your work, and then we'll say goodbye. Thanks for having me. Your lovely listeners can find my blog at maverickchristian.org and my YouTube channel, Maverick Christian. And yeah, I guess that'll do it. All right. Well, Wade, thank you so much. It's been a blast. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. All right. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Wade Tistammer. You can find a link to his paper and some other resources on this paradox and previous episodes I did with Dr. Robert Coons that are relevant all over on the show notes page. You'll also find links to Maverick Christian. Um, his blog channel, and that information, as well as his Twitter. That can be found over at classicaltheism.com slash tisthammer, and that's T-I-S-T, and then the word hammer, H-A-M-M-E-R, classicaltheism.com slash tisthammer. I hope you enjoyed that episode, this discussion of a paradox, which in turn supports a premise in our Kalam cosmological argument. Um, I just want to invite you, if you're someone who is really interested in defending Catholic Christian ideas in conversation, I've got some real good stuff to offer you over on Patreon. If you want to become a financial supporter of the show, there are a couple of goodies that you get. uh, And one of them, it will actually depends on the level. Some levels, I got a whole lot of goodies. Uh, But one of them, just for joining at the $5 level, you get access to uh, bonus audio with particular guests when I sit down with them for Patreon bonuses, a little extra uh, content. And so what I did is I sat down with the two most recent guests, Simon Hewitt, as well as Wade Tisthammer, and they both kind of gave us a teaser of their upcoming work. So Simon Hewitt, we discussed his book on apophaticism a little bit further. And for Wade Tisthammer, he gave us a teaser on one of his upcoming papers uh, defending and nuancing Alvin Plantinga's argument against naturalism. So if you're interested in hearing those extra excerpts, head over to classicaltheism.com slash support and you can get access to them. But oh, also another benefit of, a, of becoming a patron, you're automatically entered in our into our free book contest. I try to give away at least one book every month um, on a topic related to defending Catholic Christian ideas. This month, I'm giving away Brant Petrie's book on Jesus and the Jewish Roots of Mary, and I'm pleased to announce our winner. Congratulations to Matt Sewell. So Matt Sewell is our winner of the free book contest this month month. And you might know Matt because he's been a guest on the show before. And if you want to be entered into all free book contests, just you can become a patron at any level. And I'd be happy to get you in on that action. Hey, even if you can't support the show financially, I am so uh, grateful for you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming here to learn more about philosophy, history, theology, and defending Catholic Christian ideas in conversation. I hope to keep equipping you with a lot of great content as we continue through 2020. I hope you're having a good week. Please know that I'm praying for you.